Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Ted McClellan tonight in support of Midnight in Vehicle City and in conversation with author Anna Clark. First, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. Um, the chat is closed, the webinar chat, but you may want to keep that chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Midnight in Vehicle City from Literati. There is also a link to purchase books in the description below if you are watching us later on YouTube. And if you're watching us live this evening, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion using the Q&A feature available to you at any time. And I'll read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. So please don't be shy. Whenever the spirit moves you, please feel free to submit those questions. Also, another reminder tonight, we do have signed book plates. So if you would like a signed book plate in your copy shipped out from Literati or picked up curbside, let us know when you place an order and we'll make sure that happens. And as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So for, without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Edward McClellan is a journalist, historian, and an author born and raised in Lansing, Michigan. His work has been published in numerous places, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Chicago Reader, and on Salon and Slate. He's the author of several books, including Young Mr. Obama, Chicago, and the Making of a Black President, Nothing But Blue Skies, The Heyday, Hard Times, and Hopes of America's Industrial Heartland, and How to Speak Midwestern. And Anna Clark is a journalist living in Detroit. Her writing has appeared in Elle Magazine, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Political, Politico, and The Columbia Journalism Review, and other publications. Anna edited a Detroit anthology and Michigan notable book, and she has been a writer in residence in Detroit Public Schools as part of the Inside Out Literary Arts Program. She's also been a Fulbright Fellow in Kenya and a Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan. Her books include The Poison City and Literary Luminaries. They can't hear you, but they can sense it through the, pow the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Ted McClellan <laughs> and Anna Clark into your living rooms. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for spending some of your evening with us. This is going to be really exciting to talk about um, talk about this book with its author. And am, am I right, Ted? Is this is this your actual publication day? Is today? Yes, today? yes. It's Groundhog Day. So if the Groundhog sees its shadow, the strike's going to last for six more weeks. Whoa! <laughs> the radical reinvention of Groundhog Day. <laughs> right. <laughs> So um, I've got lots of questions. I'm sure okay. you may have questions as well, but I think um, first it is it would be a good to hear some of uh, some of the story. Oh, you want me to? All right, I'll read the the, the most the most exciting excerpt, the most exciting part about about the battle of the running bulls. And just to, just before you jump in, can you give a little context for folks who might be um, just brand new to this? Like what? What is that battle? Well, this, this <laughs> is when the mean? this is when the the well, it'll come out. But this is when the uh, company turned the heat off and the Flint police attacked uh, Fisher Body uh, Plant Number Two, uh, in uh, right along the Flint River. So they gotcha. this uh, and the strikers fought them off. Okay, on January 11th, the heat inside Fisher Two goes off at noon. In the middle of January in Michigan, the air is so cold that nostrils flap shut. When a man draws a deep breath, every exhalation manifests itself as a cloud of steam. Hands become chapped and reddened. That day, the temperature tops out at 16 degrees. As the early winter chill begins seeping through the brick walls of Fisher II, the hundred or so men inside realize that the company means to freeze them out. Fisher II is on a rise just north of the Flint River, and the plant is running 1,000 workers to produce 450 bodies a day, which are shipped to the assembly line at Chevy in the Hole via a viaduct that crosses Chevrolet Avenue. Since the beginning of the sit-down, the strikers inside Fisher Two have spent most of their time playing cards, singing union broadsides, and keeping fit with daily rooftop calisthenics. But some have been preparing for the confrontation General Motors now seems about to incite. 
Fred Ahern, who installs trunk boards, fashions a blackjack by loading a leather pouch with lead. Men unload car door hinges from storage kegs, lining them up on windowsills to employ as missiles against a potential assault by the bulls, the plant guards and police. To prevent a rear guard attack, they weld steel plates to the back doors and the doors leading to the overpass, then roll auto body dollies against the vulnerable entrances. For the first two weeks of the strike, General Motors has provided heat to the strikers occupying the second floor of Fisher Two, and has allowed their wives to pass homemade ham, stews, bread and pies through the windows. Gus's Cafe, a Greek diner with a big shop tray, donates meals. The plant guards inspect the care packages to ensure they contain no alcohol, then allow them past the gate. Every evening at six o'clock, a union delegation delivers supper from the strike mess. The 11th of January is different. That evening, the usual contingent of eight company guards, led by Pete Peterson, has been reinforced by a 22-man detachment armed with clubs and led by the chief of the Fisher Body Plant Police. Around the same time, a contingent of Flint police is gathering a few blocks south of the plant, blocking traffic on Chevrolet Avenue. First, the guards carry off a 24-foot ladder the strikers have been using to clamber in and out of a second-story window. Then, when the food arrives, the guards bar the door. Not only is GM planning to freeze the strikers out, it's planning to starve them out, too. The company has been told by a Pinkerton spy who was part of the original occupation that there are only 100 men inside Fisher II. It seems like an easier target than Fisher One, whose striker population is two or three times greater. One of the sit-downers, Roscoe Rich, is standing at the front gate, a set of metal reinforced glass doors when the food delivery is blocked. He runs upstairs to report the blockade to strike leader Red Mundale, who's working in one of the administrative offices. Red, they stopped the food from coming in, Rich reports. Who the hell stopped the food from coming in, Mundale asks. Well, Pete Peterson, he locked the door. Will you go and tell Pete Peterson you want the keys to that door? Either he opens it, or gives you the keys. If he don't give you the keys, Roscoe, you take your flying squad and you bust that damn door in. That's all there is to it. Just go down there and tell him you want the keys. The flying squads are paramilitary units ready to rush to trouble spots. Words of the blockade reaches strike headquarters at the Pengelly building short of six o'clock. Janora Johnson, she's the leader of the Women's Emergency Brigade, the, the, the women's you know, paramilitary uniform to support the striking men. Uh, they there were women working in the plants, but they were expelled because they didn't want GM spreading any rumors about what might have been going on uh, in there between, you know, uh, strikers' wives and and strikers. Uh, they, they thought that strikers' wives might think there was something going on. Mm -hmm. So that's how women are participating in this. And we're going to hear more a little bit more about this later. Janora Johnson is rehearsing a play there with her husband, Kermit, her sister, and two friends. Hearing the strikers are being denied food and heat, they all drive over to Fisher too. Outside the plant, Pickett singing Solidarity Forever march in circles on the sidewalk, pausing to warm themselves at kerosene-fueled salamander heaters. From a second-story window, a man shouts, we are having a meeting and electing a committee to see about getting our meals through. The committee decides that the method least likely to provoke a scrap with the guards is to pile food into picnic baskets and hoist it through the windows on ropes. At 8.15, Victor Ruther arrives from the Pengelly building in a sound car accompanied by his brother Roy and a United Rubber Workers organizer from Akron. By then the police have barricaded Chevrolet Avenue both north and south of the plant, but Victor is able to slip through the blockade via a side street. Well, so they turned the heat off on you, Victor broadcast to his loudspeaker. So they shut off your food. They have talked of avoiding violence. Now they have taken the first step. Victor has brought along a phonograph. Yes, I mean, if they want to hear some music. No, shouts a club wielding striker leaning through the window. We want action. Send a committee to the gate and tell those guards to open it up and turn on the heat, Ruther shouts back. With instructions from Red Monday all inside the plant and Victor Ruther outside, Roscoe Rich returns to the main gate with a 15-man flying squad, including Pete Pavlich, a brawler nicknamed Black Pete. They will break through the gate with brute force if the guards refuse to open it. Black Pete is prepared for this showdown by wrapping stick solder around his hands. Rich confronts Peterson, who's standing inside the locked main entrance to the plant. From the street, Victor Ruther issues a decisive command. Take the gates. Now, either you open that door, Peter, or I'm going to open it, Rich demands. I lost the keys, Peterson retorts. I'll give you three minutes, Rich replies. Rich begins counting down. When he reaches zero, the flying squad surges past the unresisting guards and busts the locks on the doors. The strikers rush outside and mingle with the pickets on the sidewalk, while the overwhelmed plant police seek shelter in a women's restroom. From there, they radio the Flint Police Department to report they've been captured by the strikers. Minutes after the strikers break through the court doors, two columns of Flint Police begin crossing the bridge from their positions on the south bank of the river. 
They're armed with tear gas and wrapped in bulletproof vests. Their faces hidden inside World War tear masks. With goggle eyes and rubber snouts, the officers look like a platoon of bipedal insects. Here they come, the pickets cry. Striker William Connolly is standing just inside the door. Gripping both ends of a black shack, he is shredded through the handles. He braces his feet against the center post. Captain Edwin Hughes of the Flint Police commands the strikers to open the gates. He gets no response. Above the front door is a window reinforced with chicken wire. A police officer smashes the glass with the butt of his tear gas gun. Connolly thinks the weapon looks like a pistol, but he also thinks he ain't got guts enough to shoot a harmless worker. The cop does have guts, firing a tear gas shell into the crowded lobby, the room where on ordinary workdays, employees punch in for their shifts. The flame from the discharge singes Connolly's cheeks and temporarily blinds him. He drops to the floor and begins crawling backward on his knees, seeking the safety of the shop floor. Meanwhile, a team of strikers has hooked up fire hoses. They kick open the door and direct the nozzles at the police who are still firing tear gas through the broken window. By God, thinks Mondale, we haven't got a lot to protect ourselves with, but if we can get those water hoses down, we will just wash them the hell out of here. Gas seeps in, water gushes out. The spray knocks several officers to the ground. Mundell notices a canister still discharging gas. He orders the men with the hose to sweep it out the door. Jesus, hit it with that water hose. Hit it with a water hose. From the open doors, windows on the second floor, strikers pelt police with door hinges stockpiled for this moment. The tidal battle turns in the strikers' favor. The wind is blowing out of the north, wafting the tear gas toward the police who cannot advance into the cold, stinging spray from the hoses. Emboldened strikers surge out the front door and chase the retreating police toward the bridge, hurling any projectile they can lay their hands on. Hinges, bricks, nuts, bolts, milk bottles, shards of curbstone, even snowballs. The stars and stripes forever blares from the sound car, a surreal patriotic soundtrack to the melee. The pickets join in the route, smashing police car windows and overturning a Genesee County Sheriff's Department cruiser, which contains Sheriff Thomas Walcott himself. It was bad enough they turned the car, my car over, Walcott later remarks but they did it with me in it. When he emerges from the upside down vehicle, Walcott is struck in the head by a flying missile. He's one of nine law enforcement officers injured that night. Others are set upon and roughed up by pickets and strikers. Fred Ahern tears an ashtray out of a police car and uses it to crown a cop who's beating a fellow striker with a nightstick. Halfway through the retreat to the bridge, the police turn and open fire into the pursuing mob. God damn, I got hit, Mondale hears a man cry. He turns to see blood running down Hans Larson's legs, struck by buckshot from a police rifle. Police gunfire wounds 14 strikers and two pickets. Striker Robert Mamero is shot in the leg and the hip. Gigmo takes a bullet to the shins. The young strike supporter who works for the streetcar company is hit twice in the belly. Nearly 3,000 spectators have gathered outside the plant, most of them sympathetic to the union. Ruth asks anyone with a car to park it on Chevrolet Avenue to block the police from resuming their attack. Go home and get your guns, Ruther beseeches through the sound car megaphone. Don't give up. Keep on fighting. We have reinforcements on the way from Toledo and Akron to help you fight these guys. Despite this call to arms, there are never guns inside the plants. Uh, UAW organizer Bob Travis doesn't want to give the cops another excuse to use violence. The wounded men are taken to a restaurant, then driven to Hurley Hospital in ambulances and private cars. Inside the plants, women press wet towels against the faces of tear gas men. Uh, the corporation is charged to sit downers with disregard for property, Bellows Ruther, but it is General Motors who tonight through the city police have destroyed property. All during these days, the Fisher body workers have been sitting down peacefully protecting their jobs, religiously guarding the machines at which they earn their livelihood. Not a scratch has marred a single object in the plant until tonight when the police shot their gas and bullets in, the, in a cowardly attack on, upon these unarmed and peaceful men. What could they do but defend themselves as best they could? They must now fight not only for their jobs, but for their very lives. Let General Motors be warned, however, the patience of these men is not inexhaustible. If there's further bloodshed here tonight, we will not be responsible for what the workers do in their rage. There are costly machines in that plant. Let the corporation and their thugs remember that. Janora Johnson, who has rushed over from the Penn Gilly building after hearing the strikers were being denied food, asked Ruther if she too can address the crowd from the sound car. He hands her the microphone. These, those men had no firearms, Johnson shouts. They were defenseless in the face of firearms. I asked all the women here tonight to come down and stand with your husbands and brothers. If the police are coward enough to shoot down defenseless men, they're coward enough to shoot down women. Women of the city of Flint, break through these police lines and come down here and stand with your husbands and your brothers, your sons and your sweethearts. In response to Johnson's exhortation, women surge toward the plant. As they pass through the police lines, one has a rubber coat torn off by a cop, but the police don't stop the women, nor do they fire again once there's a danger of hitting one. Having been repulsed once and facing a hostile crowd, the police hold their position on the bridge only occasionally to save face 
lobbing a gas bomb that illuminates the sky above the plant. The Flint police run out of gas shells at midnight. They appeal to Detroit for more, but are told that none can be spared. Sheriff Walcott himself halts an attempt to distribute rifles for a second attack. There's going to be no shooting here, he tells Chief Wills. I'm the leading law enforcement officer in the county during any troubles, and those are my orders. So that's that's probably the most action-packed part of the book. It is action-packed. I mean, it's <laughs> it breathtaking. And just to just to kind of backpedal a little bit, um, can you can you tell us a little bit about what the context is of the like how did who were the workers in um, um, in Flint who are participating in the sit-down strike? Who was General Motors in that era? Like, what? Who are the players here that met so violently in this particular? Yeah, era? well, I mean, General Motors, you know, uh, was just the all-powerful company in Flint. I mean, Flint was the the birthplace of General Motors, and it was organized by uh, Billy Billy Durant. You know, he was the one who put together the five. The, you know, the five companies, you know, I think they, they started out with uh, Chevy and Buick, and then they added Pontiac and Oldsmobile and, and, and Cadillac. So, I mean, General Motors, you know, Flint grew, it was doubling and tripling in size every decade. They were just so desperate for people to come. They would go down south and with train tickets and, they, they, you know, they'd say, here's a free one-way ticket up north. And they finally quit that because too many hobos were trying to take advantage of it. Uh, I, I mean, and there, there was such a demand for housing. People would sleep in the woods. They'd sleep in tents. Um, you know, they they rent beds at eight-hour shifts. Uh, and, you know, General Motors, they owned houses. They built houses. It's a neighborhood called Civic Park. They built that. So they would hold your mortgage. They would pay your salary. Uh, you know, they, they ran the IMA. Um, Industrial Mutual Association, which is where the recreation was. So it was just very much, you know, a, a company town from, yeah. from, from top to bottom. Most of the people who were, lived in Flint somehow drew a paycheck from GM or, or one of its uh, subsidiaries. So uh, people thought it was all powerful. And, and GM, and, you know, in and, and Flint, they had a few, um, you know, key plants. Fisher One, that's where, you know, the dyes were that stamped out bodies for the entire uh, company. So they thought, well, if we capture this plant, then GM can't make cars at all. So that was, that was sort of the, uh, uh, the target at the very beginning of the strike, but they, they sent an, an, an organizer there. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I was, I just reread a book by John Steinbach called In Dubious Battle. It's about a strike. And I think I was kind of inspired by some of that literature from the thirties, some of that proletarian literature and some of that, um, uh, noir literature because you know he 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 goes there he checks into a cheap hotel there's guys you know gm spies waiting in the lobby with newspapers and they're tailing him everywhere and you know he does things like he'll go to the movies and he'll go in and he'll go out the back door to try to keep people from following so it was very surreptitious there were all these secret meetings underground meetings because you could get fired if by by gm if uh they found out that that you were involved in organizing it if you were involved in the union one question like so gm is one of the most if not um the most um you know powerful companies on the planet at that time right why did they feel like these workers were so threatening uh well they they thought all you know unionization was was threatening i mean this was the this was the era of of the new deal and alfred p sloan who, who we'll meet later you know he he was he was the guy who he really, he really built GM. He, under his leadership, it surpassed Ford. He was very much a man of the twenties. He didn't like the new deal. He didn't like, they thought, they thought, you know, it was socialist. A lot, a lot of, and a lot of these union organizers actually were communists. Um, so, uh, and, you know, they wanted control over their operations. They, they just thought, well, why should, why should a union tell us how to make cars? We know how to make cars. What did specifically the sit down strikers, what were they asking for? What did they want? Well, one of their big um, complaints was what they called the speed up. Uh, you know, they were just, the line would just run faster and faster and the men could barely keep up. I mean, they'd go home exhausted and they, could, they couldn't even lift their, their fork to their mouth. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, some of the older guys couldn't just keep up at all. And they would, uh, you know, they just get let go. I mean, it was like aging athletes. Um, and that was one, you know, the piecework rate, 
you know, they didn't even know how much money they were, they made and depended on how, how many cars they produced. And, and also uh, the job security. I mean, you know, some guys would bring, you know, if you, if you had a farm, it was easier to keep your job because you'd bring food to the foreman uh, and, or you'd have to go paint his house or you'd have to throw him a party. And if he got fresh with your wife, you had to, you know, look the other way mm. because uh, you know, the, these guys had control and this was during the depression and, you know, everybody, people were desperate for jobs. And uh, if you, you lost yours, there were guys waiting outside in the street, outside the employment office who were, who were ready to take your place. So when we're talking about work and we're talking about jobs, it, you know, the, the lines blur in many ways, especially in a company town, it sounds like, you know, like a, your professional, your professional life, so your personal life, it's all like, oh, yeah, it's all yeah. braided together. Exactly. Exactly. And I was just reading about the, uh, in Besmer, do they say it? Do they say Besmer, Alabama? I know they say Besmer, Michigan. Maybe it's Bessemer, Alabama. In <laughs> um, <laughs> the UP, it's Besmer. Um, but the, the, there's an Amazon warehouse where there's a strike vote. And it's just amazing how similar uh, mm-hmm. what they want is to what the sit down strikers wanted. They, you know, they say that there are just inhuman productivity quotas, just like the speed up. And they say that there's not a you know, there's not enough job security. There are arbitrary firings, and they want more say in in how things are done in the workplace. So, uh, this is, I guess, a, a you know a timeless story of a struggle between workers and management. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one of the things that makes me curious. I mean, like for you as a writer, in in, in choosing to revisit this time. Um, yeah. In history, and and of course, I'm I'm sure you're, you know you're already very mindful of all the different ways it's influenced the not just the auto industry but the whole nation, the whole world, right? Everything, um, but like how um, I guess like I guess how are you able to like how can you how do you trace I guess the 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 long tail? I mean, if the sit down strike celebrated as, as a success. Yeah. You know, because they did win the right to collectively bargain. They did win right. you know, a lot of these reforms. But yet, as you just said, workers are still having these exact same kind of battles. And now with like the added precariousness of being replaced by robots or having the country right. China. So like, how do we how do we understand the legacy of, of late one of labor's most famous successes when in so many ways we're still we're still at square one? Yeah, well, they, they have an event every year in Flint. I guess they're not going to have it this year called White Shirt Day. And it's celebrated at one of the union halls. And they call it White Shirt Day because everyone was supposed to wear a white shirt to work to show that they were just as good as the bosses. Hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, they all sing Solidarity Forever. And there are women dressed like they wear red berets of the Women's Emergency Brigade and serve uh, bean soup and apples and, and bread, <laughs> just like they ate in, they ate, they ate in the plant. It's crazy, uh, but, too. But I mean, I went to the first one I went to, there was a UAW vice president who said that now most uh, auto workers in America are non-union. They're, you know, they work in these, in these foreign plants, uh, like Volkswagen plants, Honda plants that had never been unionized and the UAW has never uh, been able to make uh, inroads into. I know they tried a few years ago uh, yeah. in, in Chattanooga. So, you know, they, 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 they feel like this is just, you know, a constant, a constant struggle. You know, we I just mean, had the GM strike, right? Like right. Yeah, just, yeah, just, just, I think, what's, I think that was in 2000. The other GM strike. I guess. Yeah. My mom's, <laughs> my mom's next door neighbor works in the shop and he was, he was out on strike. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I just think they, they think it's a, it's, you know, it's a constant battle, a constant push and pull. Uh, between between labor and management. And I think one of the lessons of the book, though, is that, uh, you know, in, in order for workers to succeed, they they succeed when government takes their side. I mean, they're, mm. they're I call them the three Franks in here. They're Frank Murphy, the governor of Michigan, he could have legally expelled the strikers, but he sent the national, after the Battle of the Running Bulls, he sent the National Guard to Flint, but he just told them to keep the peace, to, you know, to keep the police and the strikers apart. And then there was you know, Franklin uh, Francis Perkins, who we'll meet later, the Secretary of Labor, the first woman to serve in a cabinet, and she was very much on the side of the strikers. She worked very hard to get uh, uh, GM and uh, GM officials and uh, union officials together. And then, you know, Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course, he he tried to keep his distance, but he did make some phone calls to GM officials who 
wouldn't listen to anybody but the president of the United States to, to get them to, yeah. to negotiate. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, when government takes the side of working people, working people uh, succeed. I mean, it was very much a, and, and they timed the strike for the inauguration of Frank Murphy. Uh, it started on December 30th, 1936. And of course, Michigan governors are sworn in on January 1st. So they so were mindful of that. Like, that right. idea, like if we're going to do this, we're going to do this when we have the best chance of having support from top level officials. Right. And, you know, he had won with the support of labor and he, you know, he wanted to be president. Uh, he actually was not reelected, but he ended up on the Supreme Court. So hmm. uh, he did all right for himself. Did he end up deciding major labor cases in the Supreme Court? Do you know that? I'm just curious. I'm sure he did. You know, I don't know as much about his Supreme Court work as I do on his work as the governor of Michigan. I think there's, isn't there a courthouse named after him in Detroit too? There is. Yeah. 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 So yeah. He's, 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 he's imprinted on the landscape right. of justice. He's still, he's still remembered. <laughs> still remembered in Michigan. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the legacy of the sit-down strike was outside of auto working per se, you know, what was, how did it reverberate to? Well, I, I, know, I know that, you know, there, there was a book uh, about the sit down strike there written 50 years ago by you, my professor named Sidney Fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to write my book was that today is such a different air, you know, moment in the history of Flint and the auto industry and the union, the labor movement and middle class. But he, you know, he talked about how that inspired some of the, um, you know, the, the lunch counter sit downs of the, of the 1960s, mm -hmm. that, that, that tactic was, was sort of, uh, you know, uh, pioneered there. And, um, you know, and one reason I wanted to write it was because uh, one of my, our uh, family friends was a sit down striker, a guy named Everett Ketchum. He lived to be 98 years old. And I just kind of felt like his, his life exemplified uh, what the strike had achieved. I mean, he, he started making 25 cents an hour. And when he retired in the seventies, he was making $27 an hour, which is, is a tool and die maker, which is good money even for today. And he was kind of a minor local celebrity in Lansing. They called him the, the tooth fairy of the flapjack shack. Cause he noticed that a waitress, you know, would always cover her mouth and she had really crooked teeth. And he said, well, how much is it going to cost to fix your teeth? She said, $14,000. He said, well, here's a check for $14,000. Oh my goodness. Go fix your teeth. And he did it for two. He did it for two of these women. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he, he, he led a you know, very middle-class life. He owned houses, uh, uh, camp, off-campus houses in East Lansing and, mm -hmm. and, and rented, rented them out to students. And, you know, at that time in the, in the 70s, you know, I went, to, I went to high school right across the street from a Fisher body plant, which is no longer there, of course. And uh, I think, you know, if you were a skilled tradesman at GM, you had the best job in town. I mean, because those guys ended up keeping their health insurance, uh, for, for life. And I think that's probably one reason why Everett lived to be 98 years old. He wow. was one of the last surviving sit down strikers. He died in 2013. Wow. That's amazing. Um, do you, how do you think, um, I mean, I feel like, like examples like that, this sort of like this sort of changing perception of what it means to work, like what your right. expectations are of, for things like healthcare, for things like uh, wages, your ability to support your family or buy a home and all that. I mean, I feel like that kind of, that sensibility definitely went beyond General Motors, you know, General yeah. Motors families and all that. Um, that's, and I wonder like how, how, I mean, do we have to like, what, why have we, I guess, I guess, why have we forgotten a lot of these? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it feels right. like you hear things like that and it sounds incredible and it makes me feel really happy for them. It also sounds so far away. You know, I'm talking to you as a 40 year old person who uh -huh. like has spent a lot of years of her life without regular, you know, right. a regular right. job or regular healthcare and all this stuff. I mean, it feels like so many of us are just scrambling. Right. And, and that's the norm now. And, in, in a, as opposed to that, like, uh, uh, as opposed to that, um, um, vision that a lot of uh -huh. those sit down strikers were aiming for and, and got to enjoy. And it's like, it, I mean, do you think like, has it been, um, is it like, is it because we just have to like relearn it and rebuild it industry by industry by industry? Is it because there was, was a concerted backlash? Um, is it because like, 
shifts in government, shifts in um, yeah. government. Well, I mean, that's certainly, I mean, there's a great book called Rivet Head. Have you read that one by Ben Hamburg? I meant much of it. Yes, it's wonderful. He's a yeah, I mean, writer. it's a, it's it's just kind of about the last great, you know, class of, of GM hires. He hired it in 1977. He was a guy with, you know, high school education, not much ambition, but, you know, you know all of a sudden he was making 400 a week then. And, and as he said it, more more health insurance and evil Knievel could piss away in a million bus jumps. <laughs> Uh, and, and it was just taken for granted. I mean, when I, I, I uh, we had a teacher at my high school and he would lecture us in the early eighties and he'd say, you know, it used to be, you could walk across the street to that plant and get a job. You didn't have to study, uh, but you guys are going to have to study and go to college because those jobs are, are, are gone. And, and so that maybe lasted two generations in, in Michigan where you, you, you knew there was always, you know, GM or Ford or Chrysler to, to fall back on you could you could just always walk into a, a plant and and get a job but yeah i mean i certainly certainly with ronald reagan he was very hostile uh to the union movement and um i think in the 50s um 33 of um workers belong to unions i mean i don't know if you watch that movie the irishman i don't know if you've seen that i haven't the, okay, but the but, teamsters right like right the teams Right. Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, Jimmy Hoffa was a national celebrity. Walter Ruth or George Meany, they were household names. Uh, who can name a labor leader today? Uh, Do you think, I mean, I, I have heard, um, I guess, like the critique that uh, that has become kind of normalized in a lot of ways is that, you know, is, is kind of blaming unions. Like you asked for right. all these things and it right. pushed these companies out of the United States. Um, it, it forced these companies to um, either close, <laughs> go bankrupt, as General Motors did, um, right. and, or, um, or you know, whatever, like replace everybody with robots. Like how, um, well, like, you know, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Well, idea? yeah, like, I mean, the guy, the guy from Wall Street that. Journal, of course, he said, well, look at Flint today and look what the UAW. Yeah, exactly. A Flint. lot of people I'm, blame I'm, that. And Detroit, too. Well, but if, I mean, I think Flint's problem was Flint was just a one horsepower town. I mean, everything was GM. And, you know, GM's uh, hourly workforces, you know, I mean, in the 70s, I mean, I think I have that in the book in the, in the 1980, Flint had the highest salary for, for young workers of any city in the country. I mean, that's not all that long, 1980, you said, right? Like 1980, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and I think they had like 80,000 GM workers and now they have like 6,000. But I mean, they they only have a company wide. They only have ten percent of what they did. So it's it's pretty consistent with uh, the decline of of the hourly um, worker in GM. So you know, I mean, I'm from Lansing, and we have GM plants. We also had the state capital and the and, and Michigan State uh, U University. So we had a diversified economy, which which Flint didn't. And I think that's the real reason GM suffered. And you know, and I think it is a valid point when you say that one reason. The country was so prosperous in the 50s and 60s is that the rest of the world was still suffering the after effects of World War II. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we had we had no competition, but I certainly don't think that's a reason to go back to, you know, some of the conditions we're seeing the workers at that the Amazon right. um, uh, warehouses, you know, complaining about, you know, no, no job security, you know, you know, you know, working people to working working people to exhaustion. I mean, you know, the it's, as the UAW people will tell you that the system strike wasn't about money. It was about, you know, fairness and, and it was about dignity. Right. I, um, I mind just being mindful of the time. I also, right. um, I understand we have a little bit more to share. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to, we're going to voices from the era, <laughs> right. We're going to read, uh, you know, um, Francis Perkins was, uh, we said very involved in this and, uh, she tried to get Alfred P. Sloan to meet with, with John L. Lewis and Alfred P. Sloan was a very kind of stiff necked guy. So uh, she did a, she left a great oral history uh, with Columbia University in which she just recreated the conversations that she had with Sloan and FDR and Lewis and all these people. So we're gonna- so She always comes out on top of them. <laughs> of course she does, yes, it's her story, yes. So, uh, well, uh, and Sloan is now remembered, I think, as uh, he's the guy who funded Memorial Sloan Kettering mm -hmm. Cancer Center and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So, so I'm gonna read... also a Flint guy. Yeah. Kettering, yeah Kettering they're, University. they're everywhere, guys. Once you start seeing right. them, you start seeing them everywhere <laughs> around the nation, around the world. You'll find well, everywhere. Sloan wasn't in Flint. He was in New York. He was a New York guy. As, as I'm going to try to do a Sloan impersonation because he had. Oh, a so book. you guys, he's this guy is a guy who wrote a whole book about accents, which you should also <laughs> buy from Literati, um, not that other place with bad labor practices. Um, right. But uh, they uh, so he, he he might embody his character a little more. All right. Mine, I, I am not brave enough to share the okay. accent, um, but I am going to try to bring the spirit of France. Right. Well, Sloan had a classic Brooklyn accent, as you said, like the Bowery boards, or like, as you said, Bud's funny. Okay, so here's Sloan. I'm sorry you had trouble getting me, but I have to keep people off me. The fresh people on the newspapers call me all the time. They'll do anything to get through to my telephone. Even some of these fresh schools from the union call me up. I just have to keep a strict watch around here. I won't even speak to my good friend, Walter Chrysler. He tried to call me up the other day. You wouldn't speak to Mr. Chrysler? Finally, he came over here. I was very much upset. I thought it was somebody impersonating him. But I didn't want anything to get a talk with me, to commit, get me to commit myself, to say something. Well, Mr. Sloan, all I wanted to suggest to you is this. I have been thinking about this a great deal. I have wondered if there was any possible loophole which would make it possible for you to deal with a union in at least a limited way. What, what do you mean limited way? Well, with some limitation on their degree of representation. Well, well, I don't see how that would work. I would never agree to anything that makes a man join a union. They can work for me anytime they want and they don't have to join a union. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's American. They don't want to belong to a union. None of them want to. Well, no, Mr. Sloan, some of them do. We do know that so many thousands of them have joined the union and paid their dues. They had a convention. There was an awful lot of people in it. I don't know how many of the employees of General Motors belong to the union, and I won't for one moment say that I believe the figure given by the union itself is necessarily the correct figure. But we know that a great many people uh, do belong to the union. What about them? Haven't they got a right to? The law says they have a right to join unions of their own choice. Uh, Where are you going to draw the line? Well, I wouldn't deal with any union unless I'm an absolutely bona fide belong to it and work for me. If they work for somebody else, I won't have anything to do with it. I won't deal with anybody who doesn't work for me. The entire point of a union is that officers who specialize in bargaining can negotiate with a company more courageously than its own employees. But I'll put it to the union nonetheless. I don't want you to think that I'm going to walk in anything like that. After all, what do we do in General Motors? We'll tend to commit the whole automobile industry. It isn't right for me to commit the whole industry. They'll try and press all the others. Oh, well, no, Mr. Sloan, you've got to accept something you know. I'm not sure the men will accept this, but I want to propose it to them as a possibility, as a basis for the beginning of talks with your company and your people. Uh, I don't think so. I don't want to do anything. Mr. Sloan, I think I'm at liberty to tell you this. I believe that Big Steel is going to deal with them on something along those lines. Uh, Well, I should think that if they can endure it, we can endure it. I think that might be a good thing. Now this is, and then that next we have a second conversation when uh, Sloan goes back on his word when he said he was going to agree to and just make a some negotiation context. with the union. When about this is about like you know towards the end of the like sit down strike. When when about it? When are these conversations? Uh, I'd say they're probably in late January. Okay, late January. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When, and just if you're kind of like the, it would December thirtieth to like. February 11th, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're in the 84th anniversary of the. the right, but this is before they captured um, Chevy for the, the engine plant. Uh, and at that point, GM couldn't make any cars at all. So that they really had to negotiate. So, you know, he wasn't ready to, he wasn't ready to give up yet. Okay. okay so, so someone says, I don't think these union leaders are in good faith. I think they got a crook in the organization. I'm not going to do anything of the sort with the men. Mr. Sloan, you gave your word. You gave your word in front of witnesses. You are a scoundrel and a skunk, (laughs) Mr. Sloan. You can't do that kind of thing. That is a rotter. That's a quitter. You have deceived people. You've misled people. You don't deserve to be counted among decent men. Decent people don't do such things. You'll go to hell when you die if you do things like that. You have let down people. You have betrayed your government. You have betrayed the men who work for you, betrayed your stockholders. Are you a grown man, Mr. Sloan? Are you, are, are you a neurotic adolescent? If you're a grown man, stand up and be a man for once. You can't talk to me like that. You can't talk to me like that. I'm Alfred Sloan. <laughs> I've got 70 million and I made it all myself. You can't talk to me like that. 
haven't you ever read what happens to the rich <laughs> man? It's like the camel trying to go through the eye of the needle. If you've got $70 million, it's going to drown you, Mr. Sloan. It's going to sink you for God's sake. Don't say those words to me again. It makes you wor a worse rotter than I thought you were. Well, that's a very passionate performance. Well, you know. <laughs> I, I, slow, I, do, slow. I, I, I do wonder if she like, as she's like re remembering it, you know, right. she added a little, and another thing. You know? <laughs> Sloan slow was not a passionate guy, so I wasn't, you know. He, he was he, he was very much the original organization man. The organization I, man, yeah, that that's right. it. Like literally, like that's literally it. Like, I mean, he, he would have been. He would have been. Yeah, he did. You know, mm -hmm. he been the man in the gray flannel suit, but he was kind of a he was kind of a pop. You know, he used to wear spats and high collars, like a, a guy from the twenties. Amazing. So that was actually really fun. I, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I do, I, I, I believe we have some questions coming in oh, and, right. and I think John is going to help us out with that. Yes, we do have a question so far. If you've got a question okay. uh, for Ted or for Anna, please feel free to write it in. Um, but the first question that we have from Pete, Pete writes, how important was it to, to the success of the strike that Michigan had a progressive governor, Frank Murphy, labor secretary, Francis Perkins, and president and FDR. Yeah, well, yeah, as, you know, as I was saying, uh, the strike was timed for the inauguration of, of Frank Murphy. You know, Frank Murphy was a guy who was, you know, committed to social justice. He was committed to labor. He campaigned among union members and he was, you know, won a very close election with the help of the labor vote. So they thought he was going to be uh, sympathetic. And, uh, you know, he, after the Battle of the Running Bulls, he sent the National Guard to Flint, um, not to expel the strikers, but to keep the strikers and the police apart. You know, the, 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 they were there in, in the streets with machine guns and artillery cannons. Uh, and, uh, you know, he worked, he tried to bring the two sides together you know, he thought he negotiated what he thought was uh, a settlement in Lansing that broke down. Uh, and then when Perkins got uh, GM and John L. Lewis to both negotiate, they did it in Detroit. And so the, the final um, the final agreement of the sit down strike was negotiated by Murphy uh, in a hotel. And well, in, I think it was actually in his brother's courtroom. And, what they used to call recorders court uh, in Detroit. So he, he, you know, he was there, he, he signed the agreement um, and, uh, you know, he was very much on, on the side of, uh, of labor. You know, he, he made it clear that he was not, he, he wasn't, he wasn't going to settle this violently. He wasn't going to send the national guard in to, even though there were, they had a, even though GM had a court injunction, uh, he wasn't going to enforce it. He, he wanted to, he wanted to settle uh, at the bargaining table. That is pretty extraordinary. Think about that. Like you're elected to governor and this is number one or thing happening. Like it, it, this is your first six weeks on the job. I mean, that that's right. You know, he's going from zero to a hundred. I mean, that, <laughs> right. you know, no matter how capable you are, that must've been daunting. <laughs> right. I mean, that was all, that was all he did. Yeah. As you said, the first, his first six weeks on the job. Hmm. Fascinating. That's really yes. interesting. That is the only question we have so far. So Anna, if you had questions you didn't get to yet, I'm happy to turn it back to you okay. and, and continue to encourage folks to submit questions. And I will jump back on if we get any um, before the end of the hour. Well, one other question I had, you touched on this just a, a minute ago about, um, about how the uh, organizing uh, influenced uh, civil rights organizing in the 60s. Yeah. Um, not just in Flint and Michigan, but around right. the country, right? Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how that legacy has con um, around uh, organizing um, has uh, continued on to today? Um, well, I know that, I mean, I know that the UAW was very much, you know, one of the unions who were, that was, uh, you know, they were supportive of the civil rights movement. You know, Walter Ruther, I think, marched with Martin Luther King uh, in Detroit, you know, that, that certainly made them different from the, the Teamsters. Um, the Teamsters didn't like the UAW and the UAW didn't like the Teamsters because they thought they gave the whole, the whole labor movement a, 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 a bad name. Um, so I, I think that, uh, I, I guess, 
I think it's more of a, I, I guess I see it more as a blueprint for, for, for labor organizing than anything else. I mean, I, you know, I said in the, in the epilogue that, you know, I think that, that these Amazon workers all sat down uh, in their warehouses. I mean, especially now when so many people are buying things over the internet, they could, they could just stop all commerce uh, in the United States from happening. I mean, I think it's, it's a more effective tactic than walking out because if you walk out, they can bring in replacement workers to, uh, to do your job. Scam, That's what makes me call. wonder, like, when would the last big effective uh, sit-down strike was, you know, whether in labor mm -hmm. or, or elsewhere? Because, um, of course, there's been strikes in many realms, some disastrous, some right. um, effective. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about, like, that particular model of occupy, occupying. I guess right. Occupy Wall Street might right. be the closest I mean, thing to it. <laughs> but, you know, certainly the, I mean, this wasn't the, uh, you know, original sit-down strike. There have been sit-down strikes in, in Europe, uh, the, you know, in France, uh, uh, that, that, you know, they were, they were modeling this after. But, you know, this one, it just, it just came at a, a, a particular, as you say, a progressive moment in American history and the, in the history of the New Deal. And it led to the, uh, you know, it, it really validated the United Auto World. I mean, after after this, they they signed up, you know, tens of thousands of workers, and and Chrysler signed a contract with the UAW. I think just a few months uh, after the contract that was signed as a result of the sit-down strike, and eventually they even organized Ford against their resistance. There was that that battle of the overpass. Right. You know, Ford tried to crack down on the union. Right. There's a couple more questions. Oh, good. Um, Jan writes in, both of you have spent many days and hours in present day Flynn. Yeah. How does it present condition? Uh, how does its present condition strike you, so to speak, in terms of its former glory days? How does the significance of the sit down strike and the water crisis, in Anna's case, get reflected in Flynn's difficult current conditions? Well, I think Anna has something to say about that. And, 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 and you, I think you have something to say about the legacy of organizing. Well, I have like, I, I, I have thought a lot about, um, and I, I don't know if I have like some pithy wisdom, I guess, but I, it does seem, I feel like compared to other cities, especially uh, of its um, relative size, you know, the, 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 there, it, it, there is an unusually prominent um, culture of community organizing that has been passed down through generations, right? Like there is, there is, um, in, in specifically in Flint like that. Um, and it, it, I don't think it's um, surprising that a lot of the water activism of the last a few years um, um, was, had, had union leaders like right. involved with it. Like they, they, they literally learned it from them. And even those who weren't specifically auto workers themselves, I mean, this, they, they, you know, you learn a lot of these like practices and blueprints and um, the, that, that sort of culture of um, like the, the emergency brigade of like trying to take care of each other, trying to mm -hmm. like meet basic needs in emergency circumstances that feels very alive in the, um, in, in how the last few years um, have been experienced by people in the community who um, well before the world was paying attention, were trying to take care of each other, get each other water, make sure they have information, even when they don't really understand what's going on necessarily, but doing their best um, to mm -hmm. make sure people are okay. And I feel like that's really quite moving, honestly, um, and just uh, stays with me. Um, I know um, Jan is a Flint resident herself and may have some insights to share that <laughs> and add some more texture to this. Um, oh, this is the Jan yeah. we're hearing from. Where are we hearing so. from Jan? We're, ah. I mean, according to, according to little, I saw the little tag. Oh, <laughs> You're out I, I see that. Okay. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I, I just think of modern Flint as kind of a fascinating offbeat place. I just say that there aren't too many other places to give you more room to be an individual or be an eccentric if you want to go that far. I think a lot of Flintstones do. You know, I used to be friends with these people who lived right by the old Buick City plant, and they had bought three vacant lots. I think they bought them for like twenty-five dollars a piece, and they made this uh, 9 11 memorial um, mm -hmm. that just drew people. I think it was actually in one of Michael Moore's movies, although they didn't like the way they were uh, portrayed. Um, and I mean, it would just draw people from all over, all over the area to see it. I mean, and you know, you can get a great house in Flint for less than a hundred thousand dollars. So. I do think sometimes like, I mean, I, I've, people in Flint can, 
speak more to this, but like just from a observer, like I, I do feel like it can I, I imagine it feels challenging sometimes to carry this weight of history that's very literally around you, you know, like the ghosts of mm -hmm. all the people that used to be there and the, all the Right. plants that used to be there and they're just and they're quiet now or they're stagnant they're empty you know like that I mean, I feel like that's a right. lot of weight um that has made it maybe difficult for the city as a whole to like reinvent itself to be something right. new, to create new traditions to make other his marks on history and um but I am intrigued by some of the things that are happening like at the old you know on the sites of some of these like um, mm -hmm. um key places in this at Dump Street like like key auto plants being like reinvented as you know parks where there's like this literal reclamation of the soil by like, oh right are you trees. talking about chevy, chevy mm -hmm. commons that's what i was thinking well, i mean of formally yeah, the but, whole, yeah. <laughs> but you know flint does have i guess maybe a lot of empty spaces for something new i mean there's that have you seen some of the great murals that they put up in the last i like the ones on oh, yeah, I mean, books I'm, I'm oh yeah i mean they, they they had people come from all over the country to paint these i met a guy from new mm -hmm. orleans he'd never been to flint before he was painting he was painting a mural uh, and you know Flint still has some of that that legacy money from um, Mott mm -hmm. and so you know, I think that that partially partially um, uh, funded that so I mean I would recommend that anybody go go to Flint I mean I just you know, I just remember like this I just remember discovering have you been to the, the the temple lunchroom under the Masonic Hall? I have indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Just, <laughs> yeah, just these little fascinating places. And everything's just a little less expensive in place. <laughs> you get a full course lunch for seven dollars there. If we entice <laughs> this audience to take some spend some time in Flint and get to yes. know it when yes. doing it all safely, of course. Um, right. highly, highly encouraged because um it's um it does it does get inside you, you know. Yeah, because, yeah. And now they got a great farmers market. They do. They do. Yeah, and and uh, well, there's a restaurant called Eddie's, and I think the corn dog is called the Jackie Moon Special. Do you remember that? <laughs> from my pro. Can we get some the Will, specific the recommendations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got time for one more question, mm -hmm. and um, Linda writes another question for both of you. You have experience. You both have experience in journalism, the field of journalism. Do you see parallels with issues in that field so current labor movements happening oh god in media oh yeah you, you know when i was one. thinking when i just a moment ago when i was saying strikes that didn't go so well like the detroit newspaper strike is what came to mind in oh, the yeah. mid 90s um i almost ran I, I tried to write an article like at um at its like anniversary 20th anniversary or something like that like the sort of like last big push you know of, right. of you know organize of organized um workers in the newspaper it is it's grim folks i mean i did like the 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 there was a concerted effort to uh de uh, the the very first newspaper guild the very first union um for journalists um in the u.s was in cleveland at the plane dealer and just it was it has been systematically systematically um um destroyed just utterly destroyed um and and now they're by like this whole like complicated oh we have this other publication that's like totally different it just also has no union people and we're gonna you know and it, like last may they um like this spring they like their last handful of workers in the um at the plane dealer who were in part of local one were like um laid off basically oh, right, and, and, it, and it, right. it was um i did i think you wrote about that didn't you I did, I did. And, it, it, and it was something I've been listen. watching for years just because yeah. I mean, this has been a long, long effort. There's a lot that's like so dangerous and terrible and it makes journalism all the more precarious of a profession um, nowadays when I would argue we need it more than ever. Um, right. Well, on the that's... plus side, there has been a lot of unionization at, at digital first sites and things like right. that that yeah. has been, uh, that is changing the game in a lot of ways. I, I know the Chicago Tribune unionized. Yeah, like place and uh, they have an active like staff that like never ever would have touched this of before. Right. Like um have the like Idaho statesman recently did. These are not mm -hmm. liberal bastions, folks. But I think there right. is the desperate circumstances the um that uh journalists are in at not just historic newspapers that have all the challenges, but also like newer sites that have a whole similar but different sets of challenges i think a lot of folks are like you know what like we we like we can't we can't we we, we if we don't take care of 
ourselves, no, literally nobody will. And, and, right. and, and it's not just our livelihoods that's on the line. It's, it's an independent, <laughs> it's an independent watchdog for and chronicler of our communities. It's when it's gone, it's gone. Um, anyway, I'm on, I'm, I'm it's a clearly a passion. <laughs> Good. Ted, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I I was glad to see to see you take because you're a lot closer to the to the issue that that I, I don't know. Do you, I know you just got a new journalism job. Is that unionized Republican? Oh, oh, well, we're not going to talk about that. I'm not going to. I'm not trying to get. I'm not going to get you in any trouble here. <laughs> but I will. But I will. Say, I will say that, like, yeah, a lot of people. There is a lot of you mentioned like the peace work before that was like a core issue. Right. Like, yeah. Like they, I, I, that I related to that as a freelancer, which so many people sure. are freelancers or on contracts, you know, or things like that. But it's, it's precarious. People want you, want your work, but they want to not support you basically as, right. as little as possible. And I think a lot of people can relate, um, even when they have the parent, even though they're working, you know, full time or whatever, have the, the, yeah. the, 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 um, the circumstances are much thinner and more limited for many, many people than, um, than I think they should be. Um, the, the, the good news is there are a lot of folks who've been working on this um, for a long right. time. And there is, it does seem like there's some momentum change. Well, I mean, it seems like uh, late, I mean, the National Writers Union was part of the UAW for a long time. I think they just disassociated, but it, nowadays it seems like it is easier to, to uh, organize white collar workers than blue collar workers. Interesting. I, mean, I think you know, you know, you think about school teachers, civil servants, like you know, librarians. I mean, there's been a lot of union uh, organizing among uh, uh, graduate assistants. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's but then something you, Ann Arbor folks, you know, imagine right, any but, college town folks who are listening to this. I imagine. But then you know, then you in, in these southern auto plants, they had signs saying, hey, "Don't make Chattanooga the next Detroit." Oh. So, yeah. I, I like I literally felt the hurt there. <laughs> I yeah, hurt. That <laughs> no. hurt my feelings. And, and, and you can you can you can probably guess what they used a picture of. Oh no. The Packer plane. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which has been closed since the fifties. So I know. I know. That doesn't even count anymore. <laughs> I know. But there and were the people living. The owner says it's going to be condos someday. So <laughs> there were there were people living in there and scrapping it until just a few years ago. I met them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, truly. Yeah. Um. I, I do notice we're at seven o'clock. So yeah. Jen, I defer to you um, for. How yeah, we've we've reached the. I'm sorry if you if you wrote in with an uh, additional question. We're at the top of the hour. So we're all right. Well, up, thank, thank you. you for writing it in. Um, thank but, you, John. Thank you, yeah. Anna, for for being here for and, and performing in our little play and <laughs> asking all those great questions. And yeah, I have you. to go. I have to go to Lansing next. I have to compete with the Iowa Michigan State basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. And folks, I, I mean, do reach out to the, I'm sure Ted was very open. If you have questions, if you want to talk about it offline, I'm sure it'll be very open to. Yeah. To yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a website. You can just leap over to his other event, ask him the yeah. question there. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a website. It's just my name at rumacallen.com and you can contact me through, through there. Buy all your books from Literati too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll get to, we'll get to, we'll get my signature in there. Yes. By, uh, by, and by Anna's book. Oh, yes. sure. Why not? By the Point City. <laughs> Both are available at Literati Bookstore for curbside pickup or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. Okay. Ted and Anna, thank you so much for joining us. And thank to all you. of our viewers, thank you. And please continue to stay safe and be well. We'll see you soon. Take see care. You soon. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.